There are few images more readily associated with the death than skeletons and the bones that compose them. Death itself is often depicted as a human skeleton, with variations in attire and other accoutrements. The reason for such associations should be quite obvious. After all, bones are easily the most enduring physical remains of humans. Other tissues decay away in a matter of months at the most, barring very specific conditions that allow for mummification. The skeleton, on the other hand, may persist for centuries or even millennia, provided nothing is permitted to consume or digest the bones. Given these associations with death and the dead, it is easy to regard bones as inert dead things themselves. While I will grant that bones found in graves are quite dead, those found in living bodies are anything but. In fact, bone tissue is surprisingly dynamic and prone to relatively rapid changes despite its innate rigidity. A deeper look into the skeletons of vertebrates reveals many remarkable properties and intriguing adaptations. It should be noted that, bones or not, every animal has a skeleton of some sort or another. The skeleton is what muscles pull against to cause coordinated movement. It is the basis of structure in the animal body. Even in so-called soft-bodied animals, like many invertebrates, there is still at least a hydrostatic skeleton. This consists of an interior of incompressible fluid that is acted upon by muscles in the body wall. The vertebrate endoskeleton is actually a rather unique take on the skeletal system. It is mainly regarded as the standard skeleton by us because it is the sort of skeleton that we have, along with virtually every large and conspicuously visible animal on the planet. While there are certainly exceptions, they are rare enough to be manifestly considered as exceptions. Vertebrate bone tissue consists of two basic components. These are living cells, and an extensive extracellular matrix. This matrix is in turn made up of two basic components. There is an organic component of collagen fibers and an inorganic component of hydroxyapatite crystals. These crystals are composed of calcium and phosphate with a number of hydroxide ions bonded in as well. These ions can often be partially replaced by chloride and fluoride ions to at least limited degrees. Each component of this matrix is vital for the physical properties of bone tissue. Without the collagen protein, the matrix would be rigid, but quite brittle. It would be prone to shattering and crumbling under the application of even moderate levels of force. On the other hand, without the hydroxyapatite mineral, the matrix would be quite flexible and effectively unable to support internal organs or allow for significant locomotion. Considering the fact that the process of breathing relies upon a relatively rigid ribcage for the lungs to be pulled against, such a loss of rigidity would essentially be lethal. As important as this matrix is, it is quite literally nothing without the associated cells. Broadly speaking, these cells may be classified as osteoblasts, osteoclasts, and osteocytes. Each of these cell types has a distinct function in living bone, before going into these functions, it might be wise to look into the overall organization of bones and bone tissues. Each bone in a vertebrate skeleton is wrapped up in a layer of connective tissue known as a periosteum. Beneath this wrapping is a layer of compact bone tissue, which is mostly matrix, with a number of interconnected osteocytes embedded throughout. Further inside, the compact bone tissue gives way to trabecular bone, where the matrix and osteocytes are arranged into a series of labyrinthine structures. The surfaces of these trabeculae are lined with a relatively thin and delicate layer of connective tissue known as the endosteum. In the spaces between the trabeculae, one can find bone marrow of two types. Red bone marrow consists of specialized cells supplied by particularly contorted and permeable capillaries, 
and bonded together by a loose form of connective tissue known as reticular connective tissue. It is the major site of blood cell formation. In contrast, yellow bone marrow is essentially a form of adipose tissue, serving as an especially well-protected energy storage site. In many cases, the long bones of adult vertebrates are entirely hollowed out along most of their length, with an unbroken expanse of yellow bone marrow rather than the trabecular bone and red marrow typically seen at either end. In addition to acting as a protective covering for the red and yellow marrow, bone tissue serves as the structural basis of the vertebrate form and a storage site for calcium ions. It is difficult to overstate the necessity of calcium ions in the body. They are absolutely vital for transmission between neurons at most synapses, and they are a key component in the contraction of muscles. These ions are so necessary that a deficiency in calcium will lead to the slow sacrifice of bone tissue. This is something of a problem as it tends to make the bones far more prone to breakage. However, even a few broken bones is apparently a preferable state of affairs when compared with death. As one might have guessed by this point, the mineral matrix of bones in the body is continually gaining and losing calcium ions according to the body's needs. At the same time, bone matrix is continually being added to and subtracted from. Calcium availability aside, the patterns of such additions and subtractions are mainly based upon two things. First, there is the pattern of dictated growth. In the course of normal development, the skeleton begins in the embryo as a series of shapes made of cartilage. This cartilage is steadily replaced by bone tissue. The replacement process is not completed until the end of adolescence. Even then, cartilage remnants persist at most joint articulations until old age. The other factor is the amount and type of force the skeleton is exposed to. The significance of this phenomenon can be readily seen in humans that experience microgravity for prolonged periods. The astronauts that spend a few months on a space station must subject themselves to punishing daily exercise regimes in order to slow the deterioration of their skeletons. Without the constant force of gravity pulling on the bone tissues, the matrix tends to be dissolved away as it is apparently not needed in such conditions. This is something of a problem when the astronaut returns to Earth greatly enfeebled for a time and prone to bone fractures, at least until the bone matrix is properly regenerated. This adaptive quality of living bone has been expressed fairly eloquently as Wolff's Law, named for the 19th century surgeon Julius Wolff. Basically, this law states that in a healthy animal, or human by extension, bone will adapt to the loads that are placed upon it. In other words, bones remodel themselves based upon the forces that they encounter. If the load on a bone increases, it remodels itself over time to become stronger, the compact bone tends to thicken, and the internal trabeculae are modified and realigned to better cope with the forces in question. This remodeling is controlled and carried out by the osteocytes, osteoblasts, and osteoclasts working together. The names of these three cell types roughly translate into bone cells, bone sprouters, and bone breakers. Let us consider each of these cells in turn. The osteoblasts are generally located between the bone tissue and the periosteum, or between the bone tissue and the endosteum. These cells produce the collagen proteins of bone matrix, and encourage the formation of hydroxyapatite crystals around these collagen fibers. Before it is mineralized, this incomplete matrix is known as osteoid. As the osteoblasts form bone matrix, they may sometimes be caught up inside the forming matrix. Such osteoblasts become osteocytes. These osteocytes have a very particular problem. Mature, mineralized bone matrix is essentially impermeable. Thus, the osteocytes inside are cut off from the outside world. This means that they would be unable to obtain nutrients or dispose of biochemical waste materials. Such a cell would not be long for this world. Thankfully for the osteocytes, they have developed a way around this little obstacle. This can be seen most readily in the microstructure of compact bone. 
there are a series of canals running through the otherwise solid bone tissue, many of which are known as Haversian canals. Within each of these canals, one can find at least one small artery, one small vein, a lymphatic vessel, and a nerve. The surrounding matrix is arranged into a series of concentric cylinders around each of these Haversian canals. These cylinders are known as lamellae, and each group of lamellae around a given canal is known as an osteon. The central Haversian canals of neighboring osteons are connected to one another by roughly perpendicular canals, known as Volkmann's canals or perforating canals or transverse canals. Each cylindrical lamella contains different orientations of collagen fibers, giving the overall structure a far greater resilience and versatility in response to various forces. Between each of the lamellae is a layer of embedded osteocytes. These osteocytes are confined into tiny chambers known as lacunae, and they are connected to one another by a multitude of slender projections. These projections can be seen under microscopic cross-sections of compact bone tissue. They consist of living cellular material contained in minuscule canals known as canaliculi. Each layer of osteocytes is connected to the layers inward and outward to it, and the entire system connects to the central canal. The nature of the cellular connections is quite intimate. These cells do not merely touch one another. They are fused by numerous gap junctions, which are specialized protein complexes that link adjacent cell membranes. The cells effectively share cytoplasm directly, functioning in some regards as a single vast cell spread thinly throughout the bone. This is a system that is reminiscent of what is seen in plant tissues. Here, the ubiquitous plant cell walls are similarly impermeable, and so the plant cells are joined together by plasmodesmata, an equivalent to the gap junctions seen in animal tissues. Returning to the osteocytes, their connections allow them to efficiently share food and oxygen, and collectively dispose of metabolic waste via the Haversian canals. They accomplish more than this, however. Gap junctions are not only found in bone tissue, they are also remarkably common in cardiac muscle. Here, these gap junctions similarly connect the individual muscle cells, making the entire heart into one giant cell, sometimes called a syncytium. The purpose of this is straightforward enough. The electrical signals that prompt heart muscle contractions are readily and rapidly transmitted through the connecting gap junctions. It is much the same with the osteocytes. When a bone is subjected to mechanical forces, the network of osteocytes is able to sense the slight deformations. Electrical signals are generated as a result and find their way to the connected osteoblasts and osteoclasts on the bone surfaces. This modifies the activity of these cells, adjusting the maintenance and remodeling of the bone in direct response to the forces it encounters. Last of all, we come to the osteoclasts. Their function is essentially the reverse of the osteoblasts. Where activated osteoblasts generate new bone matrix, osteoclasts dissolve it away. The osteoclast itself is a remarkable and fairly unique sort of cell. It resembles the amoeba-like white blood cells, though it is generally larger and contains multiple nuclei. The underside of the osteoclast is covered in microscopic finger-like projections that greatly increase its surface area this portion of the cell is sometimes called the ruffled border. There is a distinctive ring around this border, which is filled with dense actin filaments. This part of the osteoclast adheres very closely to the underlying bone matrix, effectively sealing off a space between the ruffled border and the matrix. This part of the cell is sometimes called the clear zone, as it lacks most internal organelles, or the sealing zone, for what should be obvious reasons. In the course of normal functions, the osteoclast adheres to the bone surface via the sealing zone, and the ruffled border secretes a combination of acidic hydrogen ions and various proteases. The hydrogen ions dissolve the hydroxyapatite crystals, while the proteases break up the collagen fibers. One might regard the osteoclast to be somewhat nightmarish, and certainly it would be a fantastic movie monster if it were scaled up a few orders of magnitude. 
To this day, I am quite convinced that one of the more outré aliens in the original Star Trek series was based upon an osteoclast. Destructive though the osteoclast may be, this is a necessary counterpart to the activity of the osteoblast. Proper bone remodeling and maintenance is based upon a balance between continual creation and destruction. It is believed that over several years, Bone Matrix may lose some of its physical properties by natural degradation, and so the constant destruction by osteoclasts and replacement by osteoblasts is necessary to maintain proper bone function. Indeed, it has been said that a typical human replaces their entire skeleton, just a little bit at a time, every decade or so. This is quite the contrast to the relatively inert reputation of bones. Rather than being associated with death, the skeleton of a living vertebrate is vibrantly alive. It is constantly aware of external and internal forces through its osteocyte network, and it is constantly remaking itself via the balanced activity of its resident bone sprouters and bone breakers. This constant remodeling is why a broken bone can be mended simply by placing the fragments close together and holding them there for a few months. Most of the other connective tissues could not boast such a capacity for self-repair and regeneration. Torn cartilage and ligaments must be surgically trimmed or stitched together, for example. A broken bone, on the other hand, needs only to be set properly and given time. In the end, a deep look into bone tissue reveals a fascinating alien realm, where cells entomb themselves alive and maintain physical and electrical connections as a part of their normal functions. It is a place where blood vessels wind their way through labyrinthine canals, supplying these extensive interconnected living networks. It is a place where the outer surfaces are crawling with little cells that add to the underlying matrix and relatively monstrous cells that dissolve it away. Such a landscape would not be out of place in the most fantastical science fiction tales. It is the sort of environment one might expect in a particularly eldritch fever dream. And yet, this bizarre world is hidden away within each of us, quietly overlooked every day. Thank you for listening, and I hope you have enjoyed today's little foray into the unknown. If you are still curious and wish to venture a little further, here are a few things you might consider looking into. If you found this video enjoyable, do feel free to leave a like. If you believe others might enjoy it, by all means, share. If you wish to see more of this channel, a subscription should prove quite helpful. Until next time.